Have you ever owned a Polaroid camera? Do you remember taking a picture and then having to wait? You hold the photo in your hand, you shake it, you glance down to see if the image is coming into focus, and after a while, like magic, the full photo appears. I want you to have that image in your head as we engage our next series, Clarity, Out of the Shadows. Jesus is helping his disciples to gain a sharper focus on his work. They will need clarity to carry on. Jesus invites us on the journey. Are you up for it? I came across a, um, a little article that was kind of amusing. It, uh, it had everything to do with letters of recommendation. There was a, a bank in Chicago that had asked for a letter of recommendation from a young Bostonian who was being considered for, a, uh, for employment. The Bosman Investment House could not say enough about this young man. They mentioned his father. They said that um, he was a Cabot, that his mother was a Lowell. Further back was a happy blend of Salton Stalls, Peabody's, and others of Boston's finest families. His recommendation was given without hesitation. Several days later, the Chicago bank sent a note saying that the information supplied was altogether inadequate. And it read simply this. It says, we are not contemplating using the young man for breeding purposes. <laughs> we just want to know his work. Kudos to the HR company, right? They, uh, they were more interested in making certain that this person was the right person filling the right seat. They wanted to make sure that it wasn't just about the wrapping, it was about the content that went into, you know, uh, this person's skill and character. They wanted to know if he could do the job. Letters of recommendation could be pretty important, can't they? Well, part of what we're going to talk about today has something to do with this, and it'll become a little bit clearer as uh, we continue on uh, today. The story is one in which it begins to evolve. And so rather than um, fight against the flow of the text itself, I, I want to present uh, this uh, sermon today in the form of this story, all right? So if you were to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17, I want you to take note of how a scene is beginning to, to, to form, all right? It says this, it says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and set them up, and, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face, it says, shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. I, I, I want you to look at uh, this text with me, and I, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things. First of all, it's six days, it says later, that Jesus took this small band of disciples with him up onto this high mountain. Six days after... Jesus had this discussion with the disciples, asking them, who do people say that I am? It was six days after Jesus asked the disciples directly, who do you say that I am? It was six days after Peter gives this wonderful profession of faith that says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. See, that's, that's all of what took place um, leading, uh, leading up to uh, this discussion that we're going to have tonight. It, it also was one in which then Jesus would follow that profession of faith and say to his disciples uh, that he must go to Jerusalem because there he's going to suffer at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. He will be killed and he will be raised on the third day. That is a, that's new information for these disciples. Even though Jesus has been hinting about this 
for a number of the chapters already that we have looked at in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. But now the disciples are so taken back that Peter, who has just professed faith that Jesus is the son of the living God, that he is the Messiah, Jesus looks at him, whom he had just finished praising, and then turns to him and says, get behind me, Satan. You're becoming a stumbling block to me. And he says, because you have your mind on the things of men rather than the things of God. And then Jesus would begin to tell them that they would have to deny themselves. They would have to take up their cross and follow after him. Because after all, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? See, this is all what happened just a week earlier. Think about if you're in the presence of Jesus and the highs and lows of those kinds of events, you know, being brought in and praised and then the next thing being rebuked and now you're left in this state of confusion. What is all this about going to Jerusalem and being killed and then being raised? You see, they need clarity. They, they're, they're, they're not quite ready for prime time right? They're not going to go out there and start sharing all this news. They, they need to understand that the Messiah would need to go to the cross. The Messiah would need to be raised from the dead, all of which right now is kind of muddled in their thinking. So six days later, Jesus takes these three and it says he brings them to this high mountain. Notice it says that Jesus was transfigured and that um, Moses and Elijah are found there talking with Jesus. Well, when you look at this text, if you have some familiarity with your Old Testament, doesn't it sound an awful lot like what happened to Moses when God called him up to the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai to give him the Ten Commandments? Uh, let, me, let me show you what I mean. Look here in, in uh, Exodus chapter 24, verse 15. It says, when Moses went up on what? The mountain. It says, a cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. So six days, he's up on, um, he's up on, you know, on this mountain. And, uh, and then notice what happens here in, verse, in Exodus 20, 34, 29. When, Peter, when, when, um, when Moses would come down from that mountain, he came down with the two tablets right? The Ten Commandments. But notice the text here, it says he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. So this whole scene of this transfiguration, it seemed like there's precedent for that. Six days, Moses is up on this high mountain, Mount Sinai, and there he is transfigured so that his face becomes as radiant as the sun. The only thing that's missing is a cloud with the glory of the Lord. But there's one more thing I want you to look at here. Do you recall, I kind of mentioned in the beginning of my sermon that Peter referred to Jesus, what? As the Messiah, the anointed one, right? The one promised by, by uh, all of the, the prophets of, and the forefathers in the Old Testament. They, they were looking forward to this redeemer that was going to come. Matthew has just spent the first four chapters in Matthew underscoring the fact that all that the prophets said had found fulfillment in the person of Jesus. From the, from the virgin who would give birth to the place where, um, where he would be born. Like all of these Old Testament texts are now finding their fulfillment in Jesus. So Peter is getting it. 
he's understanding that Jesus is this promised Messiah. But there were things about the Messiah that he has still to learn. But what I, but I want you to note something, though, here. With regards to him being the Messiah, notice in your text it says that Moses and Elijah, they are present and they are talking to Jesus. Uh, that's what it, it says to us, right, in, in this text in Matthew 17. It says that um, Moses and Elijah are having a conversation with Jesus. Uh, some people, they, they say, well, Moses stands for like the law, right? The first five books of, the New, of your Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those books, they're all attributed to, the, to, to Moses. Moses had a huge imprint on this birth of this nation, this holy nation, this royal priesthood. Moses is esteemed generation after generation. People look back on Moses, on how he walked with God, how God used him. Think about it, the, the great deliverance, right, from Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the, the, the taking of the Ten Commandments, the, 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 the miracles of manna, giving water in the desert. I mean, so many ways in which Moses just stands head and shoulders about, about so many of the characters in our Old Testament. So they say, well, Moses stood for the law and Elijah, well, he was the prince of the prophets. So basically you have the law and the prophets here all testifying about Jesus. But it even goes a little bit deeper than that. And I, 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 want, I want you to put on your thinking caps with me a little bit because what's really being said here has everything to do with Peter's profession. When Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, and then Jesus follows that by telling him how the Messiah is going to have to suffer, be killed, and raised, that's the context in which now they find themselves up on this mountain. And then all of a sudden, everything changes. So if you're watching a movie, you're wondering, what are these guys doing in this movie? Why are they there? Well, Moses and Elijah, aside from, as I said, being uh, this great prophet and Moses being you know, the, uh, the lawgiver here, they were heralds of the coming of the Messiah. Both Moses and Elijah are tied into the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew had already made us aware of this point. I'm going to put up on the screen here for you like a, a text from Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, I pick it up here at verse 11. It's speaking about John the Baptist, the one who was the forerunner to Jesus. Now John the Baptist is in prison, and he had sent word to Jesus through his disciples and, and wanted to know if Jesus really was the Messiah that was promised. Jesus looks at the crowd and he begins to speak to them about John, about John the Baptist. And he says this, I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. So there has been this constant battle, this spiritual war that is taking place. So it's saying that for, for day, for the, uh, from the days of John until now, right, it says, the kingdom of God has been moving. And there's also been this entanglement with the men of this world. And then he says this. He says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah that was to come. Look at this text again. Jesus is telling his disciples 
and all those who have gathered around to hear him teach that John the Baptist came and had fulfilled this mission of making ready this way for Jesus to come now. And Jesus is saying that all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So that means that Moses was also playing a role in getting people ready for the coming of Jesus. That means Elijah also in his ministry was also pointing to a day when God will bring about full redemption, reconciling the world back to himself. In their culture, in their context, this was a message that was constantly going out. So this idea that Moses and Elijah are now speaking to Jesus, they're speaking to Jesus because just a few, a week ago, the disciples have come to this conclusion that Jesus is this Messiah. And now the next thing you know, Moses and Elijah are there talking to Jesus about what is going to happen in Jerusalem. Remember I said that uh, Peter said, you are the Messiah, you are this anointed one. But he also said, you are the son of what? The living God. I want you to think again at this passage that we're looking at in Matthew 17. Because it says that Jesus now, transfigured before the disciples, is having a conversation with Moses and Elijah. You want a definition of what reality looks like from God's point of view? (laughs) Reality from God's perspective is that here you have Moses and Elijah. They've been dead for centuries. It's been a millennia or two before you know, since they, they lived and, and, and walked on this, on this planet. Both of them, they, they're in reference to the past. And then you have Jesus, who is very much in the present, talking to the guys in the past about what? About Jerusalem. Because that was the issue, right? That's what Jesus was talking to his disciples about. The whole point was that he was going to have to go to Jerusalem to suffer, to be killed, to be raised. There's no doubt that this is the topic of conversation. Luke, in his gospel, will say it plainly. They were talking about the things that were to come in Jerusalem. So from God's perspective, here you have the past, the present, and the future all colliding together in this one space. Pretty mind-blowing, right? So this is the scene. What would you be thinking if you were there in those moments? Well, look at Peter. Peter then says to Jesus, he goes, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And if you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I want us to stay here for a moment. I want us to savor this moment. In the Old Testament, you know, um, culture, there were three feasts, right, that God commanded the nation of Israel to attend. In the place of his choosing, He would set his name in Jerusalem in the temple and for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? The Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of of, of Pentecost. They would all have to come together to celebrate. Well, when it came to the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths, right? What was special about that feast? Do you remember? Part of the Feast of Tabernacles was it came at the end of the agricultural year. 
So they would bring in this harvest and it would be like a party. The work is over, the land has produced food, right? People were feeling happy, you know, they, it, it was, it was a, a, a time to be thankful for the, for the blessings that God had been pouring out. But it was also a time for them to remember the past blessings, the historical blessings of God on the people. And what they would do is they would build these temporal, uh, temporary shelters and they would live in those shelters for a week, reminiscing the days when Israel called out of Egypt, spent those days traversing the desert, living in these shelters. So it was a vivid moment for them to just never lose sight of the past, but also to really embrace their present. So I only mention that is because, see, that's a context for this Jewish culture of setting up these tabernacles. So maybe for Peter, when he's sitting there, he's thinking, hey, this would be awesome for us to stay here right now. Think about it. We have Jesus. We have Moses. We have Elijah. Let's just stay here for the week. This would be a great opportunity for us to engage in all kinds of conversation maybe. And while this is going on, that's one way to kind of think about what is being, you know, uh, communicated by this whole scene. Maybe, like I said, Peter just wanted to prolong the moment. But then something happens. It says in uh, Matthew 17, verse 5, it says, while Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Oh, <laughs> here's the missing cloud. And what was that cloud representing? If not the very glory of, of God the Father referred to in the Exodus passage that we just looked at, right? When Moses goes into this, goes on the top of Mount Sinai and the cloud covers it and it says the glory of the Lord consumed that place. Well, now the, the picture is complete. God the Father now has shown something of his splendor. Only now God the Father has a different opinion it's not about everybody just hanging out and, and having this good time of fellowship. God is using this opportunity to drill home the lesson. He's about to give his own letter of recommendation regarding his son. He wants all the disciples who were having a hard time understanding why Jesus would have to go to Jerusalem, why there would be this cross, what is meant by this resurrection being raised from the dead. So much confusion, and God the Father comes in and says, listen, this is my son. I love him. I'm pleased with him. You recall those words? They were uttered once before. It was during Jesus. It was just. It was during Jesus' baptism. When Jesus was baptized, it says the heaven opened, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and God the Father said, "This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased." Just as a little side note, you do realize that in, this, in that text in, in Matthew 3, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. All in one passage. If you're ever looking for a place where you can see the Trinity, it's right there in Matthew chapter 3. So once again now, God reiterates this same truth once in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and now 
on the beginning of his journey to Jerusalem. Casting aside any doubt as to who Jesus is and how the Father views him. The Father loves him. The Father is proud of him. But look again into this scripture. There's one additional word from the Father. It's a word that gives us a sense of why this passage actually, this whole scene is, is, has been created. It's a word that puts into focus, I think, what we should walk away with today. Because the Father from heaven looks down and says, I want you to listen to him. He's my son. He's the Messiah. I love him and he's and I'm pleased with him. Why? Because the son fulfills the will of the father. There is no difference between the two. Jesus will say it plainly in the in the gospel of John. He says I and the father are one. Jesus then becomes the exact representation of his being, the radiance of God's glory on earth, clothed in flesh. And God is giving the disciples who maybe are just having a little hard time wondering what all this talk about Jerusalem is about, courage again to recognize, don't falter. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Listen to him. It's kind of interesting to me. They want to build a shelter for Jesus and Moses and Elijah. The implication here is that maybe Jesus and Moses and Elijah are on the same level. But they're not. Moses and Elijah, if you might remember, yes, they were servants of God, but they were flawed servants. You do recognize, right, that Elijah, the great prophet, would go to battle with the prophets of Baal, right? And then at the threat of Jezebel, would go all the way from Jezreel, the upper northern part of the nation of Israel, all the way down to the most southern part, Beersheba, and then another day's journey out into the wilderness, where God would wake him up by an angel and said, hey, rise and eat because you have another 60 miles that you got to travel to Mount Sinai where God wants to talk to you. And when he stands before the presence of God, God says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And God has to reiterate again that he's doing a work that Elijah really is not even fully aware of. And what about Moses? For all of the spectacular things Moses did, you do realize that God was angry enough with Moses that he said, Moses, you're not going into the promised land. You're not going to lead these people into the land. I'll let you look at it. I'll give you a a bird's eye view. You could look at this land that I have promised all the way back to the forefathers through Abraham. But Moses, you're not going. You're not the one that's going to lead these people. It's going to be Joshua. So no, Moses and Elijah are not on the same plane as Jesus. They were workmen, but they themselves never wanted to be mistaken for the son. They prepared the way. They pointed people to the coming Messiah, Listen to these words. You might want to write it down. This is a good text to go back and read. It's found in, in, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 18. This is now at the end of Moses' ministry. He's already been told, you're not going to be the leader that's going to bring them into the promised land. And notice what Moses says. He says, the Lord your God, speaking to the, to the children of those who were taken out of Egypt, he says to them, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me 
from among your own brothers. And how does he end it? You must listen to him. I can tell you that that word of Moses was understood generation, generation, generation as a promise that God was going to send a deliverer, this great prophet, this this redeemer, this Messiah. And they were always waiting. But even Moses himself is pointing the way and he's telling them, you gotta listen to him. And you know what's interesting in that context? You'll find that the people that Moses was speaking to, they had the same reaction as the disciples did on that day when God came down and spoke to them. Listen to this, picking it up right in the same, in the same stanza, right? In verse 12, it says, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. So God is about to give them the proper understanding of what this whole scene really is all about. Don't get caught up in all the particulars. Don't just get caught up in in the wow factor of Jesus' transfiguration or Moses or Elijah. Don't lose the big picture. Jesus is my son. You have to listen to him. And it says, when God the Father spoke, (laughs) all the plans to build a shelter all of a sudden went out the window. They're terrified. Well, let's go back to that passage in Deuteronomy 18. See, Moses says to to these, um, the children of those who were taken out of Egypt, it's about 40 years later, right? It says, the Lord your God is going to raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. And then it goes on. For this is what you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb, which is another word for Mount Sinai. On the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. <laughs> If you ever have any thoughts in your head that if you stood in the presence of God and God spoke, it would be just so trans, like, you know, it would, it would be transformational. No, remember, remember when Isaiah went into the Holy of Holies? He thought he was going to die. Because suddenly you realize how sinful you, very, you are. You're standing in perfection. And suddenly you just realize, I'm really not dressed for this occasion. Disciples are afraid. But take a note of Jesus' response. In verses six to eight, it says, when the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them and said, get up. And don't be afraid. Jesus wasn't afraid. Now he's coming to his disciples and he's, he's consoling them. But think about, why would Jesus be afraid? He's not afraid because the Father knows him. He knows the Father. You know what that reminded me of? We were sitting around talking with the pastors and John Cogan, who uh, has been working with our youth. And um, I'll give you, um, so John Cogan, we're sitting around having this discussion. And I said to them, you know, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of like, you know, um, when you go into someone's house and, and all of a sudden you're met by this huge dog and the thing is barking and he's agitated and the owner comes alongside and says, oh, don't worry, he's fine, he's harmless. Meanwhile, you think one chomp and this guys he's gonna eat you whole. And then no sooner does the owner say that, but one of the little kids in the house will comes running over and just barrels into the dog, sending it on its side and everything is fine. 
And John was sitting there and he said to me, he says, you just described my family. Because I have a dog, his name is Remy. Remy is 140 pounds. He's an Italian mastiff. He is a big dog. And he has a daughter, Lila, who is six years old. <laughs> and she pulls on that dog, she jumps on him, she does all kinds of things. Not so much with me. Remy's not gonna let that happen with me. But somehow or another, Remy knows Lila. He loves Lila. He's not gonna let anything happen to Lila. My friends, that's what Jesus is saying to you and me. There's no, be, no, no need to be afraid of the Father because if you know me, you know the Father. And I want you to know the Father. And I want the Father to know you. So whatever doubts that you're having about what might be happening here in Jerusalem, let's deal with that now because I want to bring some clarity into this whole situation. You see, today's passage described the events of a week after Jesus explained to his disciples why he needed to go to Jerusalem, suffer, be killed, and be raised. They all found it difficult to accept such a pronouncement. It just didn't fit in with their understanding of what Jesus was all about. But they would need to see clearly if they were going to one day embrace the Great Commission. Uh, they would need to have their vision clear, free from any distractions. They, as, um, as you think about it, they are going to need to understand that the cross is going to pay the penalty for their sin. And his resurrection will assure them of life eternal. They get that picture, they turn the world upside down. But I don't want this one truth to escape you. What is true for them is also true for us. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. And it's going to require then that we see no one except Jesus. Because that's what happened. Because when Jesus consoled them, they just looked up and they saw no one except Jesus. Jesus. 